break a rule or two and I'm going to have more visuals than normal, but when you're talking about a medium that so few people have experienced, it really helps for me to show you what I'm talking about. So how did I get started in this crazy, crazy business? Well, I was in this lab in Barcelona, and this guy had made this piece, this really brilliant researcher named Mel Slater, where, where you know, you're in this headset, heavy headset. This is quite a few years ago now, like 2007. And um, you find yourself in a bar, and there's a guy sitting on a stool here, and somebody walks in wearing the wrong football jersey, and this guy gets out of this, off the bar stool, and he's ready to kill him. And, and like this huge fight, because he was studying the bystander effect. You can't put people at real events, right? So he was using virtual reality to study how would you feel when you saw this man about to attack another man. And what I found was this headset, this heavy headset with this long cable. I was just pushing my head in to see what was going to happen, and what could I do, and how could I help? And at that moment, I was like, I'm so in this story. I can never build to have my audience out there again. They have to be in the stories with me. So at that time, um, I, 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 now I'm full-time with my company. I, I was working as a research fellow at USC, and the students were, were um, working on a piece called Hunger in the Golden State about how uh, folks were going hungry, uh, food banks were overwhelmed, here in the nation's breadbasket. And I asked the students, this is, <laughs> this is uh, back in, I guess, uh, fall of 2009, how many of you would like to do a virtual reality piece with me? And not a single person <laughs> held up their hand, right? VR was crazy, VR was dead. But I'd spoken at UC Irvine, and a professor there's daughter ended up becoming my intern, and she was just graduating from high school, right? And together we went out to food banks and started recording audio at food banks, until one day she came back into my office and she was bawling, just weeping. And she'd been at this long line where a man with diabetes, waiting for food, his blood sugar dropped too low, and he collapsed into a coma. And you know, I heard the audio, I thought, oh my God, this is it. How do I make the invisible visible? This is a piece that can tell that story, right? There's too many people. This is the There's real too audio. Many okay. people. Okay. Or somebody in the corner. Hey. Okay, he's having a seizure. Okay. So for this guy in the corner on the right, he's in the room with that seizure victim. He's trying to walk around the body. He's going to, you know, be very careful not to step on him, right? Now, what's, what's crazy about that was that, like, he, you know, could see we're in the room. He had that heavy headset on. But with these characters, by the way, who are donated, those weird CG computer-generated characters, I, I spent 700 bucks making this piece about hunger. I had no funding. And we made this crazy piece, right, like that looks so uh, unreal. And yet that man was very careful not to, not to step on the body. It was there at his feet, right? Well, this gets into Sundance for January of 2012. And um, problem is, the only headset we have is called the Wide 5, and it's a $50,000 pair of goggles. And the head of the lab is like, you're not taking that anywhere. So what are we going to do? So we start cobbling headsets together. This is in the lab. We've got these duct tape things, these crazy things. And we show up with something that looks like this. <laughs> Amazing, right? So this is opening night, and I'm absolutely terrified. I have no idea how people are going to react. So what do you think? Oh, you're crying. You're crying. Gina, you're crying. So you can hear the surprise in my voice as much as like, wow, right? Craziness. But this happens over and over again. People trying to talk to the seizure victim, down at the body, trying to touch him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of it, we, we, we knew that we were onto something. And with one more look at that goggles, you can't really tell on this big screen. And the letter on those goggles, uh, it says PR4 uh, HMD, which we called them head-mounted displays back then, instead of goggles, signed Palmer Lucky. So this is a kid who nine months later, at this point he'd been crashing my hotel room, driving the truck back, nine months later starts a company called the Oculus Rift. Two and a half years later, he sells it for $2 billion to Facebook, ends up on the cover of Time Magazine, right? Gives us the most memed cover of Time Magazine, if you can see that hilarious image. But remember, that project started out of a piece about hunger, which is kind of an extraordinary concept that I spent two years trying to make this nutty piece, became a better coder, and pushed for goggles to be ready for Sundance opening night. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about also um, some issues I think are really important about how we connect to our virtual selves. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, 1990s story was about a rape in cyberspace. Uh, it was um, written in the Village Voice, and it was about a text-based virtual world where some college student managed to hack in and started raping women in text. And they were incredibly upset, right? They felt incredibly violated. And it opened up all these ideas about how could you feel violated when this is a text-based body, right? This isn't the real world thing. So while I was at USC, I was taking a lot of students into a, a then the only kind of virtual world there was at the time, Second Life. And um, I wanted to collect data about what were women experiencing in this kind of virtual spaces. And indeed, it was really pretty, pretty brutal. I was rounded up, virtually raped repeatedly. And the third time, you know, I, I you know, had a, uh, attached a giant penis over my head. So what does a giant penis look like? This video will hopefully will play, but eh, it's not running, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you can see it's a pretty funny, ridiculous object, but it was actually attaching to people's heads. In this question that we're asking, I, I, it was like, you know, uh, it turned out that, um, like the real world, women find situations more harassing than men do. And in text-based worlds, that's true. And in Second Life, that was true. But the crazy thing that we learned was that because we asked what gender were people's avatar, men were reporting, men who played women in the virtual world, reported being more upset than women did. Now, we didn't ask why, but that's the crazy thing, right? That your virtual body is so important to you that even a guy can feel even more harassed than a woman does. Your digital sense of presence is incredibly important. The researchers I started out with, Mel Slater and Maria Sanchez Vives, they call it rare responses if real. So I'm going to move on to then what I started to make, the kind of projects, the, the, the way that I began to take journalism more and more into the virtual world. I was asked by the World Economic Forum to build a piece about Syria back in 2013. And it's sort of astonishing that the same issues are present today. But let me show you a little trailer. So how do we make that kind of a piece? As you can see, we carefully made these Bibles, these images that we got from around the globe, photographs of the streets, Google Maps, uh, videos of the aftermath to carefully reconstruct this entire scene. And I would have to tell you that right now it really breaks my heart. We have these huge amounts of Aleppo city blocks that we remodeled, and I'm sure that those streets are gone now. So anyway, at, in, in, at, uh, at the World Economic Forum, uh, we had everybody from Peter Gabriel and John McCain go through. And then we went to the Victorian Albert Museum. And it had a five-day run at one of the most important museums in London. And it wasn't advertised. So anybody who walked in saw us with our crazy gear, with our lights and our headset and these big old stuff, and you know, just our, our new technology up against this old technology. And after five days, we ended up with 54 pages of guest book comments, which a curator told us they'd never seen before. Absolutely fascinating, incredibly, uh, you know, uh, digital empathy for global citizens, really powerful, amazing stuff. I felt like I was inside the TV news. But perhaps the most common, I think I'm most proud of, of all of my work uh, comes from this end. Uh, this was a very difficult piece to experience as a Syrian whose family is still living in arms. Although I felt the piece was inappropriate at first, I've certainly changed my mind after experiencing it firsthand. It is important for the world to bear witness to the situation in Syria, and this is a powerful and effective way to do that. I hope you're able to grow this technology further. Thank you. 
<clears throat> so we've continued to innovate. We've been working a lot with some of the 360 video technologies. You should understand that 360 video, you basically have cameras on every side and you shoot from every direction and you get some very beautiful images. We've been, um, and I've had a team working in the Sudan mountains. It's one of the longest running unknown wars and the footage is coming back incredible. And um, we also have somebody shooting right now in, in, in Iraq, a Kurdish Iraqi shooting his own story of his family, what they're going through. And this is a piece that I think you guys would also relate to, where we do continue to do a mix of CG and 360. Um, this is a piece we did in partnership with Planned Parenthood. And it takes you to the uh, protesters' lines when you try to go in and uh, uh, get services from a clinic. So what do we do? How do we get this to work? What, what do, how are we making it technologically? We're scanning humans to make it as real as we can. But then we have to animate those humans. So in this case, we took audio from across the country, real stuff that had yelled at young women as they tried to go into the clinics. And this is a, an example of how we recorded that, where he had to mimic exactly the audio. You're a whore. You're a whore. You're a whore. You're a little whore. How about stop being a whore? You whore, shame on you. Start closing your legs. Start having some respect for your body. Maybe your parents should have aborted you. So, and that's just one comment of the kind of thing. So our favorite comment was when they yelled, uh, yeah, you're a wicked Jezebel feminist, you know, and um, we made t-shirts. <laughs> so, this is not a video. This is something you can walk around. This is the latest advances in which we're doing. It's called photogrammetry. And what you're walking around, this is somebody in a headset recording their experience as they walk around. This is a solitary confinement cell in Maine. Video geometry is now when you take people and you shoot them from every direction, right? And then the algorithm stitches the video together so that you can walk around the characters. This particular piece, I was commissioned by a bipartisan committee looking into the establishment of a women's history museum on the mall. And there's a report going into Congress just to ask for us to raise the money to do this, right? They'll, maybe they'll give us the okay to have our museum. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we need one, guys. Just, I won't even get into that, because it was a book. I mean, anyway, moving on from that point. But anyway, the piece I decided to make was about a woman who uh, printed the first official Declaration of Independence, because prior to that, if you signed your name, you know, with treason, and a lot of the guys weren't doing that. So this was the first one that listed everybody's name, and she actually wrote her name in full on the bottom. She actually signed the Declaration of Independence, rather surreptitiously, literally. And um, um, she was a, a editor for a newspaper, for the Maryland Journal, and it was the only newspaper that printed through the entire revolution without missing a beat. When she died, she freed her slave and left her all her money. A totally badass woman, right? So after we record, this is an actress I took what I had to do was kind of find whatever I could about her from 200 years ago, and then I wrote a script that included as much of her own writings and her own word, and we, and we did some acting with it. And then what you have to do is take a room like this. Again, this is not a photograph or a video. This is photogrammetry that you can walk around. This is, was actually a real room in historic Deerfield, and they kindly lent us this recreation that they had made. We then did the videogrammetry, and we drop our characters on, uh, in telling of the day when they were coming to collect the Declaration of Independence. So I'm going to wrap up by just talking to you that all these headsets that are coming on the market let you walk around. And it's going to be up to us what kind of stories that we're going to tell. Right now, you are experiencing the world with your entire body and not just with your mind. And that sensation is one which really gives people a connection, a sense of empathy. I think my son put it best when he said that if you are there, if you feel like you're there, you feel it could happen to you too. And I think that this has one, been one of the most important and special places for me to be able to make content, to ask people to care and connect. And I'm going to leave Do you hear me now, Noni? What I think is going to be the future next Nice step. to meet you. Welcome to Los Angeles, California. Welcome to Barcelona. Bienvenido a Barcelona. I don't know, Noni, if I could ask you to raise your arms. I would see what I'll check out Ya veo que se checa. Uh, keep, them, keep them up, because now we'll show the robot. Y ahora anirem a veure el robot, que ya veo. Can you move them a little bit more? A ver si els pot moure una mica més. Up and down. Doncs ya veo que el robot reacciona perfectament amb la noni. 
Noni, I'm ready to interview you now for, for a few minutes. Le farem una entrevista a la Noni per veure què li ha semblat aquesta experiència. You're a journalist, ella és una periodista, i fa una estona ha entrevistat un científic de Barcelona. You just interviewed a, a researcher from Barcelona, but in a, in a body of a robot. What was that experience like? So for me, it starts to feel very natural after a while. Um, occasionally, there's some problems with the, the, the eye movement in my head if I move too fast. But beyond that, very quickly, I'm in there in Barcelona with you. So thankfully, for letting me be here today. I have a special person I need to thank. My 84-year-old mother, who I forgot to remind or forgot to tell everything that I do, I forget all the time. I called her up and said, Mom, can I just put you in an Uber? And she put on her shoes and she came. So thank you, Mom, for coming over.